I want this first episode to be something very practical for you guys, something that you do every day, and that's your handoff report. So this episode is the 10 biggest mistakes that paramedics and EMTs make in their handoff reports, right? This is something that you do dozens of times a day, and it affects, you know, your interaction with us, and I want to be able to make this easier for you guys. From my perspective as an advanced practice provider in the ER, I can make your job a little bit easier by kind of telling you guys what we need and the mistakes that I see on a regular basis. The first big mistake the paramedics and EMTs make in their handoff report is leaving out the chief complaint or telling me the chief complaint way too late in the report. So the chief complaint is something that you need to lead with because that's going to immediately put in my mind differentials. And I'm going to be able to listen to your report much easier if I know the chief complaint. So if the patient's complaining of chest pain, I don't want you to lead with their cardiac history. I don't want you to lead with their EKG. I want you to say, this patient has chest pain. Then immediately I can start thinking of all the differentials that I want to rule out. And I'm going to be able to listen to all the details you tell me with that chief complaint in mind. Just like you do on scene, when you hear the chief complaint, you're immediately thinking of differentials and that's gearing all the questions that you ask. My ability to listen to a report really comes from hearing that chief complaint. Otherwise, all the details, I don't know if they're relevant or not. I don't know if your interventions are relevant. And if I get the chief complaint midway through the report, the beginning part's kind of wasted because I'm only half listening because I'm waiting to hear that chief complaint. And worse yet, if I don't get the chief complaint at all or at the very end of the report, I probably wasn't listening half the time because I'm trying to wait to hear what the chief complaint is before I can really value all the things that you're telling me in between. Also in that same vein is chief complaint is not stroke, right? So you bring in a patient, I don't want to hear chief complaint is stroke, right? I want to hear chief complaint is left-sided weakness or, you know, chief complaint is not a heart attack. Chief complaint is chest pain. Some people do get those confused a little bit and you'll get some pushback from providers when you do that. So I just want to save you some time and frustration and, you know, lead with that chief complaint or else providers are going to ask you, they're going to interrupt your report and you're going to get frustrated because we're not listening to you very well. And we're probably going to ask you questions that you've already answered, but we just weren't in the right mindset to really hear that in the absence of a chief complaint. The second biggest mistake that I see paramedics and EMTs make in their handoff report is taking way too long to give reports. The problem is an ER provider, we have so many things going on, our attention spans are somewhat limited. I would love to have like 10 minutes to listen to a super thorough handoff report, and then another 15 minutes to go in and listen to the patient talk about their chief complaint and examine them, and you know, really sit down and have great bedside manner, and we just don't have time for that in the ER. You know, We're trying to weed through all the patients that aren't dying so we can get to the patients that are dying and take really good care of them. And because of that mentality, you know, we just don't have a ton of time. So 30 seconds to a minute are kind of what we need in a good handoff report. We need all the concise details and we need it to be brief because we have to get in, we have to examine the patient, we have to talk with the patient and then move on to the next task. You know, when I'm working in the ER, you know, while I'm getting handoff report from you, I'm also thinking, oh, did I put in that pain medication order that the nurse asked me for? Or, you know who's getting that other ambulance checked in that's checking in simultaneously with you and they're bringing patients back from intake. So we're getting bombarded from a whole bunch of different directions, which makes it really hard for us to focus on, you know, one handoff report. And, you know, that's our fault. It's not your fault, but it's just something to be aware of when you get frustrated at providers for interrupting you and asking questions when you're in the middle of a report. It's possible that they're just trying to get things moving a little bit so they can go to their next task. And so it's helpful from you guys to get a brief, concise report with all the elements that we need so we can kind of go in, see the patient, and move on to the other things that we need to do. When I was a full-time paramedic, I didn't know that at all. You know, I thought providers benefited from a super thorough five-minute handoff report. I would go through all the patient's medical history. I would talk about all their allergies, all the medications they've ever been on, when in reality, we just don't have time for that. And so save yourself some time, save us some time, and, you know, 30 seconds to a minute, super, you know, comprehensive report, but very, very brief, you know, very to the point. It's beneficial to you guys, because then we can kind of get in and out of the room quicker. You guys can get back to your rig, get back to writing your reports and things you need to do, and we can move on with the other tasks that we need to do. Uh, we don't need to spend five minutes, you know, discussing the patient's history from 1995. And kind of on that same, topic, you know, we don't need you to read an entire list of 
allergies, unless you think we're going to give that patient that medication, then I would like to know pertinent allergies. But we certainly don't need to hear every allergy they've ever had or think they have. We don't need to know every medication that they've ever had unless it's pertinent. So in fall patients that have hit their head, right? I really want to know if they're on anticoagulants. So that's a very pertinent medication to bring to our attention because we're going to ask that anyway. So it's helpful if you can cut that out and we can already know what we're walking into. But we don't need a comprehensive medication list review. Now, you might get some doctors that push back on that a little bit and they do want you to show them all the medications and all the allergies. But by and large, we really don't need all that information. So if you're in the habit of reading all the patient's medical history, all the patient's allergies, all the patient's medications, you really don't have to do that every time unless you feel that it's pertinent to what the patient has going on today. The third biggest mistake that I see paramedics and EMTs make is describing the EKG as normal sinus rhythm. Now, that might be valuable information in certain contexts, but by and large, I don't need to hear that the EKG is normal sinus rhythm. So usually I hear that in the context of the chest pain patient. Of course, you're doing an EKG on them, but I don't want to hear that it's normal sinus rhythm. If they're having chest pain, I assume it's normal sinus rhythm, right? Usually people don't have severe crushing chest pain that are in a dysrhythmia. I want to hear about their ST segments and their T wave changes, right? That's much more pertinent in a chest pain patient. So even when you have your EMT tech the call and your EMT is going to describe the EKG to me, have them describe it as no ST changes, no T wave changes in the handoff report. Because that's much more pertinent, you know, with a chest pain patient that we're worried about an MI. You know, we need to know if this needs to be a STEMI activation. And likely you called that on the way in, but that's a much more accurate way to describe the EKG than just telling me what the rhythm is. Because in a chest pain patient, I'm assuming they're in normal sinus rhythm. I wouldn't assume they're in SVT or VTAC. I want to hear about their ST segments because I'm immediately worried about MI, right? That's the one of the biggest differentials we need to be concerned about. And so that's a much more accurate way to describe the EKG. Now, if you're bringing in a patient with palpitations or shortness of breath, which is much higher symptom for dysrhythmia like VTAC, SVT, atrial fibrillation, then I do want to hear what rhythm they're in. It's much more pertinent in that case to say this patient's in normal sinus rhythm, they've been having palpitations. That immediately answers my question of is this patient in a dysrhythmia? And it helps to describe the EKG that way, you know, in a much more concise fashion. The fourth biggest mistake that I see paramedics and EMTs make is in describing the vital signs. So if a patient has all normal vitals, it's okay to say stable vitals or normal vitals, as long as they're actually stable. I think on the ambulance, you see so many sick patients with just crazy vital signs, right? You're seeing tons of low blood pressures. You're seeing tons of tachycardia. You're seeing tons of hypoxia. It's easy to kind of write off subtly changed vitals as normal. In the ER, we have a little bit lower threshold, right? If a patient's a little bit tachycardic or if they have a fever, we need to call a sepsis alert. If a patient had hypoxia, I'm much more concerned about them than if they have a normal pulse ox. And I'm starting to already think they probably need to be admitted if their oxygen saturation was low at any point, um, because it's just indicative of more emergent pathology that should not be going home at any point. And in regards to the pulse ox, an aspect that gets missed a lot of times is what was their pulse ox when you initially arrived on scene? You know, were they satting in the 60s? That's really important for us to know, even if you've corrected this, because I'm probably going to keep that patient in the hospital overnight, at least. You know, if they're dropping their oxygen levels that significantly, there's something legitimate going on that probably is not going to get fixed by a few treatments in the ER. So even if you've corrected it or you've applied oxygen or given them breathing treatments, that initial pulse ox is very important information for us to get in the ER. And it's information only you can get. You know, we can't go back in time and see what their oxygen level was. The patient doesn't know. You know, we can take them off the oxygen and kind of see where it drops, but it's much more helpful to get that initial oxygen saturation that the patient had on scene. Another big thing that gets missed is how much oxygen is the patient on a baseline? Because that's going to be my next question in a shortness of breath patient that comes in on oxygen is, are they on that at home? It's going to make a big difference, right? If they're on their normal amount of oxygen, I can probably send that patient home, but if this patient's requiring significant increases, I probably need to keep them. And that's just something that is very easy to give in the handoff report and prevents us from having to ask that question all the time. So the pertinent vital signs, I mean, unless you're saying that they're all totally stable, which I think is fine, you don't need to read out every 
vital sign that you obtained on the way to the hospital if they're all normal. But if the heart rate's over 100, I do want to know that. If the patient has a fever, I do want to know that. If their blood pressure is under 100 systolic or is super high, you know, I want to know that as well. And then the pulse ox, of course, is super important in shortness of breath patients. Um, but you don't have to read them all out if everything's stable. You know, if there's an abnormality, bring it to our attention because we really need that information. But there's nothing wrong with saying stable vital signs rather than reading out a list of normal vitals. To me. That'll save your time. It'll save my time and a lot of effort. The fifth biggest mistake that I see paramedics and EMTs make in their handoff reports is leaving out where they picked up the patient from. When I was a paramedic, I'd never realized the significance of that. I don't think I ever even included that in a handoff report because to me, it really didn't make a difference. But on the provider side of things, it really matters to our disposition. Like, what are we doing with this patient after the workup's complete? If you bring in a 95-year-old lady that's generally weak, you know, we get a big workup on her, everything looks normal. I don't want to send her home if she's so weak and she's living by herself. You know, if you picked her up at home and she has no family support, I don't want to discharge her back to that scenario because she's at high risk for something bad to happen. So I'm more likely to keep her in the hospital. So where she came from is actually vital to our disposition in that scenario. On the same topic, if a patient's coming from a skilled nursing facility versus an independent living facility, that's also a very wide range of care. So if they're fairly disabled and can't take care of themselves, I can still send them back to a skilled nursing facility knowing that they're getting good care, somebody's going to be giving them the medications that we prescribe for them, versus if they're in the independent living side, I might not be able to send them back to that scenario depending on what we find and what they need done. So that's super important to us to know if it's independent living, if it's skilled, and that's kind of a distinction that I never realized when I was a paramedic. I never realized that the reason that was important, because again, as a paramedic, it doesn't really make a difference. You don't have to figure out an ultimate disposition for the patient like we do in the ER. 